Watch this. Being the fifth state in the nation to nominate our Republican presidential candidate brings Idaho to the forefront of national relevance. But did it? Idaho's GOP held its much maligned March caucus this weekend. The state party is calling it a success. And I guess that, well, depends on your standard of participation. Back to work at the state house and lawmakers were considering taking back control of who gets to send the state national guard where. Well, their name might signify something about that, but not until it's completely official. And while the Senate was getting some work done, the House, well, they kept on celebrating Idaho Day with a few musical guests, including some of our very own lawmakers. Who knew the good gentleman from Dalton Gardens could bang the bass like that? Oh, well, we are back from the weekend. How did you spend yours this weekend? Maybe taking advantage of the nearly two feet of new snow at Bogus Basin that they've collected over the last week? Maybe laid around and did nothing because you're hoping for an early spring weekend and that really didn't happen. Well, according to turnout numbers from Idaho's GOP, a lot of you were doing the latter, especially registered Republicans and your participation in the presidential caucus on Saturday. A lot of you opted to, well, basically do nothing, to not show up, even though the Idaho GOP called it a successful, quote, reenfranchisement of Idaho Republican voters after the cancellation of the presidential primary. But were Republican voters re-enfranchised? Did they feel free again to participate in picking a presidential candidate after having their rights to do so returned to them? Which was overwhelmingly won by Donald Trump, by the way, with 85% of the vote. Okay, so this is what Rhonda wanted to know about this. How, what percentage of registered Republicans attended the caucus? And how does it compare to past presidential primary turnouts? Well, Rhonda, it was nowhere near the margin of victory for the former president, but what if we told you the turnout was a lot lower than was the last time Idaho's majority party held a presidential caucus? You can find several posts on social media about the number of people who showed up or didn't show up on Saturday. Like Nick Martin, who shared this about 12.30, 30 minutes after the doors opened. In Lowell Scott Middle School's gymnasium, Nick said, this is what voter suppression looks like. This is supposed to represent seven precincts. Well, looking at District 15 numbers, where as of January of this year, there are supposedly just under 14,000 registered Republicans. And according to the GOP website, 885 ballots were boxed for a total of just 6.4% of District 15 Republicans. Similar sites in District 16. Two locations, but just 746 decided to show up out of a little more than 11,000 allowed to do so. That's a turnout rate of 6.7%. And what about District 17? Well, Natalie Fleming posted this video showing the relatively low number of ballots being dumped on a table and about to be counted. And Natalie's correct. There are more than 10,000 registered Republicans on this part of the Boise bench. But just 623 total votes were tallied. That's just a 5.8% participation. So in all of Ada County, with more than 146,000 registered Republicans and fewer than 10,000 taking the time out of their Saturday for the presidential caucus, that's only about 6.6% taking part in a county that carries the most Republicans in Idaho. Okay, so Rhonda wants to know how that compares to previous primaries for the GOP. But how about we just go apples to apples instead, since primaries and caucuses, well, they're not the same thing. To do that, we got to go back to 2012, the one and only time Idaho's GOP did a caucus and was part of Super Tuesday when it did. Saturday, this past Saturday, that is, with nearly 600,000 registered Republicans in Idaho, not even 40,000 took part in the caucus. That's only about 6.8%. Now, back in 2012, based on 2013 numbers from the Secretary of State's website, Idaho only had roughly about 230,000 registered Republicans, and more than 44,000 jumped into the caucus party 12 years ago which is about 19%, still a low number compared to how many people show up for primaries historically, which is around 20 to 25%. But this time around, only about a third of those people that showed up in 2012 showed up for 2024, 6.8 versus 19%. Not really a good one, but for some perspective, Iowa Republican Caucus from Iowa two months ago, they had their lowest voter turnout in more than a decade, which is less than 15%. Idaho holding a March caucus to make it relevant in the national picture for picking a president, 
That part still up for debate, especially considering no candidates stepped foot in the gem state and fewer than 40,000 decided for the nearly 600,000 they represent, which some critics point out was kind of the point. Okay, we did try to ask Chairwoman Dorothy Moon about all of this, get some questions answered about, well, was this a success, as you put it before? But as usual, we are still waiting for a response. And just because there was a caucus and Dems still have to have theirs, which is scheduled for May 23rd, doesn't mean we don't have a primary coming up. There are still other elections that are also to be decided that aren't about who sits in the Oval Office. The upcoming May primary will decide who represents which party for spots in Congress and in offices like the state legislature. Winners in May go on to the general election in November. The entire legislature is up for grabs, by the way. But will they run again or will they have competition? That answer will come with the filing applications, which open today. That means from today until March 15th, candidates will make it known with the Secretary of State's office they intend to be on that ballot. Okay, and we're going to look at the portal right now from the Secretary of State's office that captures candidates' filings, candidate filings as they come in. Already seeing some names populate for the legislative seats and seats to represent Idaho in Congress. For example, Mike Simpson, his name is already on there. He is filed and ready to run again as is a familiar Democratic challenger in that same race, that'd be David Roth. With all 105 seats in the State House, as I mentioned, up for grabs, we're likely to see a lot of familiar names in there, either jumping in to retain the seat they already have or opting for a new one in another chamber or in a, as a, previous, or in a previous seat, as the case may be. So for those who really like to follow that kind of stuff pretty closely, that filing page will probably get a lot of refreshes on your laptop or your desktop. You can follow along with the candidate page to see who is actually running and for what from now until March 15th. All right, speaking of elected officials, that'd be lawmakers. They were back making laws or trying to early this morning at the Capitol in Boise. Let's bring in Joe Paris now because we are told that this is kind of the time where we're getting down to the last few days. I think it's still kind of March 22nd that they're hoping to get out of town. Yeah, we're in crunch time, and especially yeah. as you just highlighted with the primary election season just looming so closely. So, yes, as Brian just mentioned, the goal is to be done by March 22nd. In the meantime, though, Idaho lawmakers are now doing two-a-days. That means they're going to meet in the morning and in the afternoon. In the House and the Senate, they did that, and I believe, actually, the Senate just got back to work at 430, so late afternoon. But major debate in the Idaho Senate today on how the Idaho National Guard should be used, specifically by the federal government. The Defend the Guard Act was debated in the Senate today, and it prohibits members of the Idaho National Guard from being sent into active duty combat unless the United States Congress has declared war or explicitly called for the Idaho National Guard under Article I of the Constitution. Legislative sponsors say that the proposal does allow the governor to still agree for deployments for defense support or civil authority missions within the United States. And yes, sponsors say they can still maintain their training regiments. But the United States has actually not had a declaration of war from Congress since 1942. Yes, that was World War II. So all action the U.S. has taken in places like Vietnam, Korea, the Middle East, they're not technically wars. And supporters of the idea, it says that it forces Congress to do their job, declare war if they need to send Americans to dangerous areas. How do you get a Congress to actually have the guts to stand up and not just point at the military and say, well, the military failed, the soldiers failed. We haven't had that kind of commitment in this country since World War II, and yet we've lost thousands and thousands of our best. Thank you, Mr. President. So critics question if the proposal would actually, though, take valuable resources away from Idaho and what message this also sends to the rest of the country. There's also questions about if the proposal would put Idaho behind if there was a declaration of war made. This hamstrings us from being able to participate in the prelude to that conflict. And it means that the Idaho National Guard is going to be allocated differently than it would if it was able to participate. The effect of this bill, the practical effect of this bill, it's my belief, will be that we don't get a seat at the table. <coughs> Talk to the National Guard. So the legislation passed 27 to 8. It heads to the full House. It's a big debate, and I know that Senator Ruckty made a good point. You know, are we debating this policy or this idea of how Congress should act? So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the House. All right, we'll keep tabs on that. Thank you very much, Joe. All right, much like the last few years, there have been a series of bills brought forth this year having to do with the LGBTQ plus community. 
We've talked about them, a couple of them already, like the self-proclaimed word girl, that's Representative Julianne Young and her gender sex bill, Representative Ted Hill's pronoun bill, the religious counselor bill, and of course there's the classic library bill. They all have some sort of anti-LGBTQ tinge to them. Today, there was a protest against these bills that have been brought forth outside the Capitol. About 100 people showed up for what they're calling March 4th protest. Our photojournalist Jason Foster was there. Thank you all for coming out to fight for our rights. We are gentle, angry people, and we are singing, singing. Republican lawmakers are obsessed with controlling one of the most vulnerable populations in our state, transgender kids. Stand up and stand out because someone has to or it won't get better. Young people deserve better. The legislature should not be their biggest bully. I demand this of Idaho's GOP. Keep our community out of your hateful bills. I belong here. We belong here. The people united will never be defeated. I am talking to the queer children for whom these bills are being written to control. I'm talking to the trans children that feel that they might not have anywhere else to turn in a state that seems so allergic to compassion. We have shown up today because we want you to know that we care about you. <laughs> know that for every litter box truther, and cannibalism conspiracy theorist that ignores your plight, there are a hundred people who support you and love you and want you to thrive. Yeah. They'll even come out in the snow to do it. Yeah. We are singing, singing for our lives. We are gay and straight together. You are the ones that must turn your outrage into action. You are the ones that must contact your legislator and say, I am an Idahoan. My friend is trans. I am against your hateful bill. I demand that you respect them. We are singing, singing for our lives. Well, today is Idaho Day. It's always celebrated on March 4th because it is the anniversary of when President Abraham Lincoln made Idaho a territory in 1863 on March 4th. And on this day, 10 years ago, former Governor Butch Otter, he signed a law creating an annual celebration of Idaho Day. Well, one way to celebrate something like this is with song. You know, like we sing the birthday song for a birthday. Why not the Idaho song for Idaho Day? On March 11th, 1931, the 21st session of the Idaho legislature designated Here We Have Idaho as the official state song. But remember, you might remember the copyright issues with the birthday song a couple of years back. Well, Idaho's tune had a bit of that too, as we explained in Idaho's 208 Recap. <laughs> 
away out in the land of the setting sun. Where the massive Rockies stand, there's Wyoming young and strong. Hail to the land of heroes, my Oregon. There's a symphony of state songs out there M -O -N -T -A. that have never exactly been Montana, I love you. Chart topping tunes. I love you. A tour around the West can tell you that. Oh, sure, they're all the greatest. You're easily the best. And all claim no better corner of the country to call home. Some states even have more than one song, and a few have caused canticle controversies like this racist line from Oregon. A reference to when the Beaver State outlawed black people. Speaking of outside the law. The majestic forest where nature abounds. Well. We love every nook and rill. Here we have Idaho. And here we have Idaho. A state song with a plagiarized past. The story goes, in 1917, the University of Idaho held a campus song contest. So student McKinley Helm wrote some words, and another student, Alice Bessie, put them to a tune that was popular at the time. They called it Our Idaho, and it won. The song was so well received, it was regularly played at university events and eventually became the school alma mater. Problem was, it wasn't really original. You see, in 1915, two years earlier, Sally Hume Douglas wrote a Hawaiian love song called Garden of Paradise. And that was the one apparently bootlegged by Bessie. So in 1930, the U of I, under the threat of a lawsuit, reluctantly bought the rights. And a year later, on March 11th, 1931, the legislature made Here We Have Idaho, the state song. Sure, it may have started as an innocent infringement on copyrights, of you. but Idahoans singing of Idaho in cars, Idaho. in concerts, winning her way to fame, with comedy, and with COVID have made it their own singing of Idaho since. Singing of Idaho. Everybody's got a version. You know, some state songs have changed over the years. We mentioned Oregon's racist tone, the line, land of empire builders conquered and held by free men, fairest and the best. That was alluding to Oregon's one-time exclusionary laws. That was only changed in 2021. Idaho State song, when it was still U of I's alma mater, the second line was written as scourged on her way to fame. Well, since 1931, it's been winning her way to fame. I guess winning is better than whipping, I'm guessing. Speaking of changing tunes about the gem state, that's exactly what representatives Jason Gallagher, Vito Barbieri, and Marco Erickson did when they brought their karaoke and six-string skills to the House floor this morning. They took the tune to John Denver's Take Me Home Country Roads, and they made it about Idaho, of course. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the majority party minstrels. Or how about uh, Vito and the Blowfish? Uh, that might work too. I don't know. That, they're not bad though, you know that? I just don't know how long they've been working on that one. All right, well, in honor of Idaho Day, we have to mention Idaho State Seal and how fitting it is because, well, it's also Women's History Month and Idaho Seal was, of course, created by a woman. 1891, the Idaho legislature approved the Idaho State Seal designed by Emma Edwards Green. It's the only state seal designed by a woman in the entire country. And if you don't know what it looks like, Check out our state flag. Back in 1890, Emma Edwards Green, she entered a contest for the state seal, and they had recently become a state. Legislature wanted one. 
So Emma, well, she represented Idaho's industries at the time, which included agriculture, mining, and timber. She also placed a man and woman on equal footing with equal stature within the design. A possible comment on the conversations around women's suffrage happening at the time, which Idaho was one of the first to do that. Emma later wrote, the woman in the painting signifies justice by holding the scales of liberty, as denoted by the liberty cap and end under spear. Equality with man standing by her side and the elk's head above the shield is because, well, elk and moose were protected at the time. Emma's original painting, as you saw there, of the seal is stored at the Idaho State Museum. Today, it was on display in the Senate, and they all were taking pictures with it. So you can check it out, too, but you're not allowed to get that close to it. Well, let me start out with the snow water equivalent. As you can look around the area now, 100% is average. If it's above 100%, it's above average. If it's below 100%, it's below average. And you can see down here, the Wahis, 159%. Wow, look at that, that's well above. Boise at 100%. Here's Payette and Weezer just a little below. I was noticing this about a week to two weeks ago, about 89% for the Boise area. So you can see that uh, we are starting to receive some recognition. Uh, with some of these percentages anyhow, with the rain and the snow and all the weather that we've had for the past couple of weeks is starting to add to it. Other areas are pretty high, especially to the southern portion of the state. Low, still low as you move to northern Idaho. So for the valley tonight, here's the storm system we're talking about. There it starts. Uh, could start about as early as 3, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. And you can see that it extends here from Boise. If you're going to be traveling, it's all the way down to Twin Falls. It's on the uh, inner, excuse me, the interstate all the way up here to Ontario. And here's how long it lasts as it continues. Look at this. Boom, there it goes until, well, close in tomorrow evening. So one to two inches of snow overnight, another inch during the day. And if it lingers, because this is a slow storm, it could get another inch. Okay, so we're just talking about quite a bit of snow here. Some gusty winds for tomorrow and then some snow decreasing into early Wednesday morning. Not going to see much for Wednesday. Here's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and temperatures eventually warm up. Then we're back to the rain thing again, but that's next week.
All right, a lot of our viewers shared with us the problems they had with this weekend's Republican presidential caucus, like this one from Todd. I attempted to attend the caucus at Meridian Middle School, but couldn't find a place to park within two blocks. A lot of people showing up there. Two hours for the caucus? Not enough. Some didn't get a chance. They had to work, says Nan in Twin Falls. A lot of people had problems with where these ballots were being put after they were being filled out, whether it was a tub, a like a, I guess it would be a Tupperware, not a Tupperware, but a Rubbermaid tub, or in some cases, a laundry hamper. Neither I nor my wife received the mailing from the Republican Party telling us where our caucus was to be held. We're registered Republicans that have voted in local and statewide elections for 10 years. It's a whitewash, says Bill J. I did not attend the Republican caucus because the Republican Party has left me. We're so far extreme, right, that I'm concerned about our future democracy and how this was handled, says Steve in Boise. How much money was spent by the Idaho GOP to get the 6.82% of the GOP vote to have major influence? We know at least $300,000 from the people who filed to be on that ballot. That was kind of spread across the state. We don't know how much of it was. Probably never know. We'll see you tomorrow.